Hi, my name is Chris and this is Battle Nonsense. Today we will have a look at the netcode of Rocket League, which is the first, well, racing game that I've tested. And since I'm really bad at this game, I won't torture you with more gameplay and go directly to the networking basics that you need to know in order to understand the results of my tests. The reason why I include this basic information in every video is that I want to provide all the required information so that someone who is new to those netcode analysis videos does not have to watch another video first to understand what the analysis is about. Also I've noticed that it doesn't really work to tell your viewers to watch another video first, so this seems to be the best approach for that. This time I've included some more information, so even if you have seen the basic information in the previous video, you might want to watch it again to learn a bit more about how routing affects your ping. But if you want to skip this section, then you can use the timecode link inside the description of this video. Sadly, I cannot provide you with an annotation anymore, because YouTube decided that the new end screen disables annotations, and I can also not use the cards feature to provide you a skip function, as a card is not allowed to link to the same video. So we can all thank YouTube for that. Now let's start with the ping. What is that, and where does the term come from? If you've seen the movie The Hunt for Red October, then you might remember that scene where Sean Connery gave the order to check the distance to the US submarine with one active sonar ping. The way this works is that your ship sends out an audio signal which then gets reflected by other objects in the water. And on your ship you have microphones which then hear that reflection. If you then measure the time between sending the audio signal and receiving the reflection, then you can calculate the distance between you and the object. The ping that we talk about for network connections is pretty much the same thing. Your device sends an ICMP echo request to another network device like a game server, which then sends an ICMP echo reply back to your device. Now, when you measure the time between sending the request and receiving the answer, then this gives us the ping or round trip time of the data. So the ping tells us how long the data has to travel through the copper and fiber optic cables to reach the other device. And the longer it takes the data to get to its destination, the bigger the difference between what we see on our monitor and what the other players see on theirs. Which is what we call lag. So when I jump, then this information takes some time to reach the server, and then the other client. With short distances between the players, this delay or lag is also very short. But when the distance gets bigger, then the clients have to wait longer until they receive an update on what is going on. So the higher your ping, the more you will lag, which leads to a bad experience. But it's not just the player with the high ping that suffers. Depending on how strong the lag compensation is in a game, the high ping player can also give the low ping player a bad experience. But that is a different topic. So the distance between the client and the server defines how long it takes data to travel between them. However, you can't take a map, draw a line between your home and the location where the server is hosted and then calculate your ping based on that distance, because the copper and fiber optic cables take a very different route and the data that you send to the server has to pass through multiple routers before it even reaches the server. So when a router has to forward data, then it always tries to find the best and fastest route. This means that when everything works as it should, then your data will take the shortest route to the game server. However, it can happen that a router either chooses the wrong route or that it has to choose a worse one when the better one is down. Such can then lead to quite big detours for your data, which can result in much higher pings and an increased risk of packet loss since your data might have to pass through many more routers then. So when you always play on the same server and suddenly notice that your ping increased, then this could be caused by the routing. And if this is the case, then you have to call your internet service provider so that they can check their routing tables. If you want to help them to get the issue fixed faster, then you can open the command prompt, type in tracer and the IP of the game server that you have problems with. You will then get a list of all the hops between you and the game server, with the pings between you and every of those hops. With that information, it will be much easier for your ISP to track down the issue and fix it. So the length of the route that connects the client to the server defines how long it takes data to travel between them. This means that our lag cannot get lower than the ping since we would have to break the laws of physics to speed up the electrons or photons that are used to communicate with the server. What adds an extra delay on top of the travel time of our data is how frequently we send and receive it. So when we send and receive updates 30 times per second, then there is more time between the updates than when we send and receive 60 updates per second. 
So by sending and receiving more updates per second, you can decrease the additional delay that is added on top of the travel time of your data. But where's that data coming from? This is where the term tick or simulation rate comes into play, which is how many times per second the game processes and produces data. So when you have a tick or simulation rate of 30, then this will cause more delay than when you have a tick rate of 60, which also allows update rates of 60 Hz then. Now, what kind of options do developers have when it comes to providing servers? One solution is that you pay hosters to set up dedicated servers for your games in their data centers to which the players then connect to. This means that your game server is running on powerful hardware, the data center provides enough bandwidth to handle all the players that connect to it, and the players are not able to see each other's IP addresses. At least as long as the game does not use a bad peer-to-peer -peer voice over IP solution. Also, if the developers ensure that all players have more or less the same ping to the game server, then you can avoid that some players have an unfair advantage. The downside of dedicated servers is that if you don't have a game that builds around the idea of having the community run these servers, then the publisher or game studio has to pay for them and they are quite expensive. Another problem is that when you release your game worldwide, then you also need to make sure that you have enough server locations to provide all players with low latency servers. If you don't do that, then you create many hyping players and that is a problem for your entire community, not just the players who don't have servers near them. The other approach is that you simply use the PC or console of one of the players to host the game, which means that he becomes the server. With this solution, the game studio does not have to pay for expensive dedicated servers, which must be available in many different regions. This also allows players in remote regions to play with their local friends at relatively low latency. One of the downsides is that the player who is also the server gets an advantage because he has zero lag, which means that in a first person shooter he will see you before you see him and he can fire at you before you can fire at him. It is also possible for the host to further exploit this by artificially increasing the ping of all the other players, which is called lag switching. And the host also sees the IP addresses of all the other players that connect to him, which is in my opinion quite a big security concern. Then we also have the problem that all players connect to the host through his consumer grade internet connection, when the worst case he could even use Wi-Fi. This frequently results in a lot of lag, packet loss, rubber banding and an unreliable hit registration. But the most frustrating part of such client hosted matches is that if your host disappears, then the game must choose another player to host the match, which means that the whole game pauses for several seconds until the host migration has finished. So while dedicated servers do not magically provide 100% lag free connections, they still offer the best possible experience in online multiplayer games. Luckily, the developers of Rocket League seem to agree, as the game is using dedicated servers for public and private matches. In the settings I told the matchmaker to only use servers hosted in Europe, which then caused that I played on servers hosted in the Netherlands and in Germany, to which I had pings between 25 to 16 milliseconds. An interesting fact is that the ping that you see in the scoreboard is not the same as the one that you see here inside the command prompt. The difference between the two is that the ICMP ping in the command prompt shows us the travel time of our data, while the value in the scoreboard is for the game data, and that is higher due to processing delays and the update rate of 60Hz adding an additional delay on top of the travel time of our data. What I really like about the ping or latency display in the scoreboard is that the developers use colors to tell the player if his ping is good or bad. That said, the values that drive these colors could need some tweaking, because with a ping of 100 milliseconds it should not be green, and with 200 milliseconds or more it should already be red instead of orange. So as I said, the processing delays of the game and the update rates add an additional delay which is why the ping in the scoreboard is higher than the one that you see in the command prompt. But what update rates does the game use? When we look at the network traffic captured with Wireshark, then we can see that the client does not quite send and receive updates at a steady rate. However, the average update rate is 60 Hz, which was a positive surprise, just like that when you create a private match, then not only will this spawn a dedicated server inside one of the data centers, it will also use update rates of 60 Hz like the public servers do. Now, there is no test that allows us to measure the actual tick rate. However, based on my delay tests and the fact that the game is sending and receiving 60 updates per second, it looks like the servers are also running at a tick rate of 60 Hz. 
Now, how long or short is the delay that two players experience when they play on the same server? To test this, I use a high-speed camera, two PCs for each of them has its own fiber internet connection, and 144Hz gaming monitors on which the game runs at 250 frames per second with all graphic options set to performance mode. To measure the delays between the players, I point my high-speed camera at the monitors and then jump the car 20 times with player 2. Inside the high-speed recording, I then look for the frame where I see the car of player 2 jump and then I count the frames until I see it on the monitor of player 1. In addition to this jump test, I also tested how long it takes until the car starts to move on the monitor of player 1. So in the jump test, I measured an average delay of 60 milliseconds. And in the drive test, I got an average of 62 milliseconds, which means that there is really no big difference between the two. Now, this is the first time that I've tested a racing game, which means that I do not have other racing games to compare the results to. However, in every multiplayer game, it's all about how fast you can get the data from one client to the other. So what we will do is compare these delays to the results of first-person shooters that I've tested. And you can directly compare these results as all games were tested with a ping of 25 milliseconds between the players and the server. Now, when compared to other games that also use update and tick rates of 60Hz, then the results of Rocket League look pretty decent. And when we compare it to the results of games that use less than 60Hz, then we can all be very happy that the developers chose to go with a decent 60Hz rate for both the send and the receive rate, as that helps to keep the delays low. Now, the most important element in Rocket League is probably the ball. So how long does it take to update the status of the ball between the clients? Let's have a look at this footage here that was recorded at 400 frames per second, where each of the players uses his own fiber internet connection, has a ping of 25 milliseconds to the server and is not connected to the same LAN. So what we can see here is that it takes a little bit until the car of player 2 starts to move on the monitor of player 1. This is because of the latency. However, the car hits the ball at pretty much the same time on both monitors. The reason for this is that the client always tries to predict what the other players do and that way compensates for the lag. This works very well at lower pings, but as soon as you have to deal with players who have a higher ping or have packet loss, then this system will have troubles to keep up, which is one of the reasons why a stable, low latency connection is so important for your online experience. So I hope that you enjoyed this netcode analysis of Rocket League and if you like this kind of niche content where I take a look at the inner workings of video games and show you how these affect your experience, then you can help me to cover the costs of this channel by supporting me through Patreon. The link is in the description below. Also if you enjoyed this video then please give it a like, subscribe for more and I hope to see you next time. Until then, have a nice day and take care. My name is Chris and this was Battle Nonsense.